purpose of interviewing uh, Pat Casey with SunTrust. Uh, Pat is the uh, regional manager in the uh, northeastern section or mid-Atlantic section of uh, SunTrust. He runs 22 offices, uh, does over a billion dollars in volume. Uh, good morning, Pat. Good morning, John. Uh, how you doing? Uh, unbelievable. <laughs> and how sparky. <laughs> yeah, doing, doing great. Tough, <laughs> tough, tough, tough night Yeah, uh, for our audience out there, uh, Pat just uh, they lost their dog of many years. So uh, uh, hopefully this will be enough interview. My my condolences. Uh, well, it, it, it helps you focus on things. Uh, you know, when you talk about relationships and, and family and friends, and even as uh, something like a, a family dog. Uh, uh, you got to uh, live life to the fullest, and uh, when you call my voicemail, you get that carpe diem. you got to seize the day every day and take advantage of it. You never know uh, how it's going to be. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Hey, uh, let me ask you, starting off, the uh, audience that we'll be talking to today, obviously, are other regionals and executives, uh, but I always like to start the interviews with uh, asking people uh, pretty much where they came from and how they got in the business and how you got where you are. So uh, why don't we kind of start there? Well, it was kind of a natural involvement. I mean, I uh, graduated from Duke University with a degree in economics back in uh, 1974, so I'm dating myself. Um, I'm a native Washingtonian and uh, probably had an affinity for real estate deep in my veins just as a young guy, uh, just uh, in general. And uh, when I graduated in 74 during the gas crunch, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of jobs going out there to uh, college graduates. And uh, um, ended up visiting my brother in a resort area for a couple weeks before looking for a real, a real job in the Washington, D.C. area and uh, got offered a job selling real estate in a resort area in Bethany Beach, Delaware. Did that for about a year and uh, found out where I liked it, although it was a tough learning curve down there. People didn't have enough gas to <clears throat> excuse me, get over the Bay Bridge and uh, get back, so it was kind of kind of a challenge. And ended up relocating back to the Washington, D.C. area and uh, uh, interviewed for what was a, my term, friends termed a real job and uh, uh, ended up going to the real estate business up here uh, for a company called Good Carruthers Realtors, which now is Prudential Carruthers. And uh, did that for four years and was, uh, I think, reasonably successful in doing that and uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, observed uh, the mortgage bankers. I ended up getting involved a lot in the mortgage banking process of the real estate transaction because I did a lot of listings as a young guy going out there selling real estate. I didn't have a lot of my friends buying them, so I did a lot of listings and found out that the financing get screwed up and uh, never really kind of realized uh, how that could happen. And so it almost became like a surrogate loan officer with the, the, the loan officers that were handling transactions and uh, learned that the way I did business as a real estate uh, broker was very conducive to the mortgage business, meaning that I serviced a small group of customers, maybe eight listings, so I got down to five, I went out and looked for more, but I did a real high quality service level for them and tried to build a relationship and a long-term basic customers, but realized that there wasn't a whole lot of loyalty of customers in the real estate business and uh, felt that my uh, financial skills and expertise and the educational background, uh, I would be in a better spot to compete on the uh, mortgage banking marketplace and it was financially rewarding and it evolved into that, I went to work for the mortgage banker that I uh, I had done business with on a relationship basis for the, the four years I'd been a real estate broker. Was this Bill Blomquist? So uh, he left uh, shortly thereafter, and uh, uh, after about eight months, the company I went work, work for initially went bankrupt, so that was another baptism of fire, and I uh, took over the manager position by default, so really was in, the, in a management role really too early probably in the, in the mortgage banking process before I really built a successful or solid origination base, but I was able to continue... Uh, manage and originate, which producing manager, which is a, I have a firm belief in, in that philosophy today, although in the changing world, it's tough to do all those things and do them well. So and yet you were a legend. Background. Yeah, and, and yet you were a legendary producer uh, for that our audience out there that doesn't know you. Uh, you literally are a legend in this area, and uh, you're head of the NBA this year, and uh, you were known as one of the most aggressive uh, business people out there in terms of management style, and uh, you have a, I believe you're a, a CMB, if I if I'm correct. correct. Well, and, I want to prove that a, a retail originator, which I, I view my permanent rank as loan officer, the, uh, could go out there and be a CMB. I have a <laughs> philosophy in the business that everybody should be a CMB, and that'll kind of maybe tie to maybe some of our other comments later on. Uh, um, about where the business should be and where we got to be to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that that leads me into the business today. And uh, let me ask you, uh, starting out, what, what exactly is your management style and your? Uh, do you have an overall philosophy of business? 
that's a pretty good good question. It'd be interesting to see what my uh, managers that work with me uh, would say about that. Uh, I, I, I view it as you know a lot of the philosophy is very similar to what Crestor now SunTrust w- w- is and was, and a lot of it came from uh, Mark Smith, former president of the Mortgage Bankers Association of America, and uh, our president for a while, and uh, has a uh, company philosophy built on an upside down organizational chart, and we really. We, Report to the people to report to the customer, the people closest to the customer, and it's not a something that's just lip service or a document. We we live that. You, John, you call me, and you're dealing with the customer. I'm working for you, John. How can I make that happen for you to get the customer served? And uh, our our company lives that pretty strongly, and it's been key uh, to our success overall. So that's really a, a business philosophy that we take with us everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what about in relationship to your uh, branch managers? Uh, what kind of values do you try and instill in them? I have to know some of your branch managers. I know they're they're very aggressive and very good, uh, uh, high volume producers. Uh, and what kind of philosophy do you personally install? And 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 what are the values you look for them? Good question. Yeah, it is a challenge. I think the uh, kind of the Jekyll and Hyde approach uh, a little bit with the, the top producing managers. The challenge is that a lot of their compensation is driven by their personal production, but they also can be rewarded under our program pretty pretty significantly uh, for managing a profitable branch in the marketplace. Uh, I guess the philosophy uh, from a management style is that I I take that high producing loan officer philosophy from my my production career to those managers, and I certainly can identify with what it takes to do both, to do your own personal production and run an office. I guess the real philosophy is that I tell them, you know, you, you, you got to hire people like yourself. Uh, you can try to change people, but you really need to hire people like yourself. You're successful. You're a top originator. The, the more you can build a system in your branch, whatever that system may be, you obviously have a pretty good bulletproof system for how you're doing your production with obviously always room for improvement, and the good ones are always trying to improve that, that system. You've got to, in effect, almost impose that system on them or find people who are willing to plug in that system that are very coachable and willing. You know, they have the attitude and the aptitude to plug into it, um, and then you know, they're, they're coachable in terms of you know, the system for doing business in general, so everybody can work together as a team and you can be more efficient. So that's always the challenge is getting people to spend time on their business you know, versus in the business to say, i got to set some time aside to develop some systems and some track records. So part of the value we try to provide here is to help them with those systems by taking the best methods and practices from other managers and cross-fertilizing it with everybody else and sharing that wealth and actually helping them systematize it so it's really almost spoon-fed but not jamming it down their throat. I think our buzzword here would be flexible. You, know, you can take the system and you can still uh, put your own tweaks to it and add or, or uh, subtract uh, you know, pieces to that system, but here's a fundamental structure that's built that we know works within our, our company and uh, how we do business and uh, you know, take and apply it and, and uh, expand it throughout all your originators and, your, and to be quite frank, your inside salespeople. Uh, we only have two jobs in the company, uh, inside sales and outside sales. And hopefully some of those inside salespeople want to be outside salespeople in the future. Well, you, you've talked in a, in a general sense uh, on your expectations, but uh, how about being a little more specific as far as some examples uh, in how you manage uh, a typical uh, uh, branch manager. Well, it's 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 almost like uh, like your children, John. They're all different, and uh, you know I, I don't view as managing. I view it myself as in a, in a coaching role to be to help them facilitate a sounding board. Many times, many times, the dialogue like you and I are having right now. Hey, how can we approach a problem? I, I hopefully I never get to the point where I think I have the answers to the solution to on every everything that comes up. Uh, we do find ourselves more and more being in an HR situation, so a lot of the specific examples are helping them work through a performance issue where you're basically moving somebody up in their performance you know, to an improved level or out. And that's always a challenge and accountability when you've got top producers that expect everybody to operate like them, and that's not going to be the case. That's probably one of the biggest challenges. Um, yeah, again, providing the infrastructure, we, uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but we have an aftermarket program that we instituted, you know, on a regional basis, mm-hmm. and it stays in touch with their customers for them, uh, which uh, for five years after closing, that cons- cons- uh, consistently solicits those customers for when they're going to re-enter the real estate market. 
um, which uh, is provides a nice safety net or infrastructure for these producers for creating repeat business from those relationships uh, uh, without them having to do anything other than maybe pick up the phone and you know say hi every once in a while and to follow mm-hmm. up on a marketing piece that's gone out. So that's I like that, that a lot. That's freed up the people quite a bit to mm-hmm. uh, focus on the, you know the daily operational tasks at hand. Um, you know, it's it's problem solving. It's solution solution problem. It's just putting two heads together. And uh, many times, my goal is to have them come up with the solution. You know, what's the solution that's going to work for you? Here's a couple of avenues we can go down. You know, what's going to work for you? And many times, in talking through it, like anything, they come up with their solution. So uh, maybe that specific thing. I think on the recruiting front, I mean, I kind of you know talk about you know recruit, train, motivate, retain. That's really our job along with the uh, producing managers are, of course, are pre-app and pre-qual and, uh, or app and app taking a loan application. I mean, if they're not doing that, sure. they're creating referrals, though they're not doing the most productive thing. So uh, recruiting is an area where we try to help, where I become, a, in effect, take a senior salesman role if they need me. You know, you want to bring in a third party, just somebody differentiating, or maybe even the, what we call the big cheese factor. You know, they want to meet the big cheese to make them feel important, which is important. And I'm going to be involved because in the upside intervisational chart, if their manager's not available, I, you know, I expect that rich to have the ability to call me, you know, page me, mm-hmm. you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, got some, we'll, we'll get it done. I uh, obviously want to get it done through the manager for a lot of reasons. You don't want to create a learned helplessness there where, you know, the people are starting to call you all the time and, um, you know, the manager's not, you know, in their position to leverage their, their, uh, their strengths and uh, manage the office. Yeah, I, I have a question sure. with, with regard to that, and that is if you look at some of the uh, published list of top performers around the country, mm-hmm. and we all know that not everybody that's a top performer uh, either chooses to participate on the list or, or, or is on the list, uh, it does strike me and uh, that you have uh, more people uh, on these lists uh, than anyone else in your region or really almost anywhere else in the country. And I, I just wonder, and I've interviewed quite a few of those people, uh, uh, Ed Navarro and Rod Flowers, some of your top producers, and I'm just curious uh, how that happened. Uh, and by that I mean, uh, not to lead you on, was this something that uh, where your branch managers uh, hired and trained these people and uh, take a certain measure of success? Or was it in the process itself where you went out and looked for the best uh, people that you, that you could find that were compatible, you know, with your company? Yeah, I think they, they come and each one has a different story attached to it in terms of how they got to the company. And then the, the key is, is, is what are your efforts on a daily basis as the manager um, to keep them here? And that's, of course, supporting their efforts. And, and I think it's a, it's a uh, if I best described it, it would be a like-mind philosophy. And I think that uh, you and I have had many chats uh, over the last year or so, and uh, I think we have a like mind philosophy about just uh, the world in general to a certain extent. Uh, mm-hmm. We may differ on specific issues, but uh, um, these are can do players. I look for high energy levels, um, enthusiasm, things like that. I think, uh, uh, not to be too presumptuous, but you know, success breeds success, and I think. I think uh, uh, people sense that when you're out there recruiting. That's why I think it's helpful when a manager's recruiting a top loan officer. Um, they want to see the management chain that's behind that manager, that you can be there and be very credible, uh, that you've, you've been to the top production levels before. You know, and, and you know, how can someone who's never done that uh, be able to support your business? Um, they can, but uh, I think it's an easier sell when you've done it and you're actively continually trying to be involved in that type of a high-level business, so I think that you tend to, you know, birds with a feather flock together, a bunch of phrases, but that's I think tends to attract that with that sent into a cockier presumption. No, I, I think well, I think it carries over uh, in business. I think uh, uh, what you're saying, Jack Wells at GE, would mimic almost exactly. Uh, I think if you look at the way the services are set up, the Army, for example, uh, you know, the generals, uh, they don't come out of supply corps. They come out of the combat arms and, and people who have been successful within that. So uh, I think in, in highly organized structures, uh, successful machines, uh, I think what you're saying is very germane. And being br- brutally honest, I, I don't think all the skill sets learned is a, uh, originator and then a producing branch manager, which has been my career path, is always necessarily prepares you for a regional manager role. Uh, so part of that CMB process and some other things is you have to be a continuous learner and and pick up the skill sets, whether it be uh, Excel, 
you know, spreadsheet capability or, you know, act database management or software learning or whatever, you've got to be a continuous learner. And I think the people that are continuous learners in any business are the survivors. Um, to be frank, on, on Rod, we, we, we Rod Flowers, he's, I think, one of the top originators in the country. Oh, absolutely. In terms of the units. Uh, I, I had the, the mere fortune, to be quite frank, inheriting Rod, <laughs> took over a region that we uh, bought a company, a little federal, and uh, by acquisition and um, through some structural reorganization, his, his area came under me and uh, actually had to you know, restructure some people and uh, put Rod in charge of the office. He was really just a top producing officer in that office, and he's done a fantastic job going from being the top gun producer in a company to also being a maintain the top gun sta- status, but also building a very profitable and successful office around him, um, which is you know fantastic. So really all I did with Rod is we shared a like kind philosophy on marketing and and efforts. So uh, we just were fortunate, I think, more in a retention mode under that, you know, recruit, train, motivate, retain. Rod, my management thing, has been more in a retain uh, situation that hopefully he stayed here as a result of the, the management support that I was able to uh, provide and certainly has opportunities to go elsewhere at any time. Yeah, and I've also noticed with some of your people, it's kind of a backhanded compliment to you. I noticed in, in your very top level people, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, Ed Navarro and Rod Flowers, and um, uh, those type of people. Uh, when I do talk to them and interview them, uh, they just finish uh, spending enormous quantities of personal time uh, talking to your other loan officers, having them down, uh, really spending days taking them out and showing them what they do. Uh, I, I think that's fabulous because in this day and age, as you know, a lot of loan officers are, are really, I'm not saying all loan officers, but I'm just saying a lot of the top ones are really rather selfish and, and just do not share. They're too busy accumulating. We've been fabulously fortunate in getting people on board that are that way, and that's the main reason for the success. Uh, the, uh, the swipe and adapt uh, is is culture is uh, well in well in effect here and uh, site visits between regions and branches is uh, occurs on a regular basis these guys are very given to their time and uh, to people at other companies too to be quite frank and uh, they get it back tenfold uh, they always get what I call the plus an idea they've got an idea or market idea and they swap with somebody and they get it back with the new and improved version I mean they, they just go ahead and uh, uh, benefit uh, even more so. so uh, Do you know I saw that actually happen with one of your people? It, it's funny, I can actually be uh, proof positive of this, that I uh, interviewed Ed Navarro for the listeners out there, one of the very top people in the country uh, in terms of performance and attitude and quality. I mean, he's just a quality individual. Uh, but I interviewed somebody else. I think, was, I think it was a fellow named Andy Lang over at Atlantic, and he told me uh, that since, and it works for a different company, and he's a top producer, as you know himself, uh, that since they are not in uh, market areas that overlap at all, they actually get together and they share different ideas. Absolutely, and they both benefit from it. You know, and the good thing is that the good, the good top people, uh, they're, they're confident that, that only a small percentage of the people are going to actually implement the ideas. You know, you might share the ideas with 100 people and only five of them implement them. And that's kind of where I view my role in the regional manager. I think to be successful in that role, you've got to, everybody has constipation of implementation situations, especially when you're busy producing. And I view our role to help people implement things, to cut through the red tape, the bureaucracy, and also just facilitate things and be an implementer. If they've got an idea, and I think that I heard somewhere, somewhere a quote that uh, a, a, uh, idea without implementation is irresponsibility. So, uh, you know, I feel I'm irresponsible if we have a great idea that makes sense. If we can't implement it, you know, I haven't done my job. And, uh, you know, I'm sure I got plenty of failures out there, but for every, uh, you know, 15 failures, we got, you know, one or two successes that are hit some home run balls in terms mm-hmm. of incremental business for us or quality of our work life. You use the word facilitator. Um, that's a kind of word that uh, a Jack Welsh at GE would not use. Uh, but, um, I'm curious as, as far as your management style. Uh, are you a hands-on, aggressive manager, or are you like, uh, let's say, Forrest Moore, senior at Mars uh, Company? Uh, as you know, he he was a very hands-on, and he would come in and uh, lay down the law, and this is the way it's going to be, and this is the volume you're going to do, and then held everybody to very strict uh, accounts. That's an interesting uh 
Oh, John, being introspective about it and probably don't think about it. It's interesting what the managers would say. Uh, I, you know, again, different for each individual. Uh, mm-hmm. I think room for improvement, if I gave myself a critique, would be to be more hands-on and to hold people more accountable on the sales process for uh, things that need to be done on the branch level. And that, again, goes back to the you know, pre- practice what you preach, having systems built on a regional basis where you have benchmarks, not a not a ton of things where you have information overload, but you have maybe uh, 10 key benchmarks that you can identify, especially if you're managing that many branches. You know, if one is not performing, it's all of a sudden it's one month not performing, two months, all of a sudden you got a quarter where you've lost money, and uh, you're, you're, you're you know, quickly losing money in the retail business, particularly if you've got a infrastructure too big in relative to the production. We've all seen that from the, the ramp ups of ninety eight and then you know downturn of business in ninety nine and then you know two thousand with the uh, inventory challenges on properties for sale that have impacted our markets. So uh, you've got to have benchmarks and systems in place to manage that process and that's probably an area that uh I struggle with, I work hard at, but unfortunately you get the same advice I give to everybody. You spend so much time in, in your business every day on the transactions that you need to take some time away and plan and, and come up with systems. Uh, you know, with your manager's input, to be quite frank, uh, if they've got some pride of authorship in helping develop those benchmarks and systems, uh, you got a much better chance of everybody implementing them and living with them and uh, in training them. Also, you know, you got to train them and teach them. Uh, what to look for and manage their P&Ls, uh, the same benchmarks that they implement in their branches uh, allows them to really, in effect, uh, help manage the region collectively because they're all checking everything for you anyway. Mm-hmm. And then free them up. Give them the time to do that by providing some structure and some systems that they were maybe doing themselves. An the example that was that marketing piece that may have freed them up from some things that we can do more efficiently for them, but still give them the ability to put their name on it. And it's, they're still marketing. They're still positioned. So we're helping them build their relationships and they're not feeling like we're threatening their uh, their customer database or anything in that regard. Yeah. You, you raise a, uh, uh, an issue in there, a small issue that I'd like to expand on. Uh, because I know you to some degree, uh, I know that you've been uh, a very vocal critic of the quality of training that exists out in the industry. Uh, and I just wonder uh, uh, if you would get into that a little bit. Uh, for one thing, I would like to know uh, your learning habits and, and what you do uh, in terms of training yourself and uh, increasing your knowledge. I know you're very, very big on this. I'm kind of throwing you a fluff ball, but uh, our audience out there are people that are in the same position as you, and I think they would like hearing it as far as your personal habits of learning. And then also I'd like for you to talk about training in general and the lack thereof in the industry. Sure. Well, you know, we, we've chatted about this, about the, uh, the way we all t- typically have started as rich as the biz. You know, here's a desk, here's a phone, good luck, you're on your own. And I've heard some of your other interviews where, you know, people you know, read the manual in a corner for a week, and uh, that's about it. Um, I, I, it kind of maybe I'll launch into my uh, where we got to be to survive in the, in the mortgage banking marketplace Please do. forward uh, mm-hmm. and uh, <clears throat> what the profile or an attributes of a successful originator in, in 2000 at, at SunTrust and in the marketplace and in general. And uh, going back to that, everybody should be a CMB. Uh, we are, in effect, uh, in my opinion, to be survivors in the mortgage banking marketplace to have a mortgage banking practice, if you will, similar to a CPA in that We've been intermediaries in the past in mortgage banking where we've been a broker of money and a uh, source for, for customers, and that, that still continues, although the structural dynamics are changing. Uh, I can't even predict where they're going today. But we are becoming more and more of an infomediary, and um, I've heard that term thrown around, and I think that's very valid, and that's valuable consultative advice that people still in this financial transaction, they may you know, surf the web and, and do a lot of their information gathering and be much more educated as a consumer about the mortgage uh, transaction, but they're still looking for that traditional advice from a financial advisor, a trusted one, if you will, to uh, help structure the transaction in line with their needs. And in order to do that, let's face it, you've got to know your, you've got to know money and you've got to know your product and you've got to know the business and you've got to be, that takes, uh, uh, effort in, uh, training yourself on the financials and being a student of the game, if you will, even down to just as simple as completely dissecting a product when it comes out, whether it be an interest only product or any type of mortgage product that's out there and analyzing it from all different ways, um, similar to a, a, a CPA or financial analyst would look at it and be able to advise your customers 
um, you know, pluses or minuses based on your needs analysis of where they are going to be. One of the questions I ask consumers is, you know, how long are you going to be in the mortgage? How long, how long are you going to be in the home? Uh, when I'm going through an analysis of what might be the best product for them. And um, that's from the training standpoint. Uh, that means uh, embracing technology, uh, leveraging it. doesn't mean you need to be a techie guru out there and, you know, you know you, if that's not the highest, best use of your time, uh, you can, if you're doing enough business, you can have somebody do a lot of that work for you, but you need to be able to uh, know what software and technology can do for you so you can manage it. There are a whole bunch of bodies out there. I've got, uh, you know, something like 65 support people, and they've all got a terminal in front of them. That's another 65 bodies I'm managing the way I look at it. So you need to know how to manage that system uh, in order to manage the people. It uh, doesn't mean you have to know all the intricacies of it. So uh, you need to invest in that piece, and I think that's part of that, you know, being the uh, lifelong learner, if you will, uh, you know, Taking classes, they're great mental health days and advice you know, people. Uh, uh, you know, take an Excel class or you know, a database or mm-hmm. whatever whatever uh, need you may have. You know, take a take a class in technology and be able to learn it so you can embrace it and uh, you know own it and really leverage it for increasing your business. I think that's where the traditional companies that embraced the the uh, you know the XML um, you know uh, technology that's out there and things like that. Those are the people that are going to survive down the down the road. Mm-hmm. And, uh, as far as training, having a formalized program within your company, and you know, if the company doesn't have it, build one. Uh, we've invested in you know videotapes. Uh, we we outsource training. We use a number of you know industry trainers in that regard. Um, certainly, being a student of just the business itself, the, the trade magazines, mortgage banking, uh, national mortgage news, uh, mortgage real estate finance today, uh, mortgage originator. Uh, to be quite frank, uh, there's a number of trade publications out there that, that have sales ideas and marketing ideas that. Uh, um, can give you ideas. Of course, the, the, one of the best ways, of course, is, is is listening to other people that are successful and modeling their behavior. And uh, that's why your your interview process and people yeah. in the country, I think, is a great way to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and picking the best out of it. Uh, one of the things I learned as a producer, and then you did too, is that uh, you never truly try and emulate uh, somebody 100%. You listen to them and you take the best pieces out and you try it out. And if it works for you, uh, you incorporate it. And if it doesn't work, you throw it away and you move on to something else. You make it a fit. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, what are some of your personal habits? I, I happen to know um, uh, that you, you're a voracious uh, consumer of uh, sales tapes, uh, that you listen to tapes uh, continuously when you're driving, uh, that you're uh, you take your free time and use it to the tenth degree, and I, I want you to talk about it a little bit because I think there's value for a lot of the regionals and branch managers out there uh, that, quite frankly, don't do this. Well, I think it's probably a replacement strategy for me because not dealing direct with the consumer um, in the last ten years in my regional manager role, where I was, you know, yeah, you know, the, the consumer keeps you very honest, John. When you're dealing with the consumer every day on a mortgage question. Um, you, you certainly keeps you very up to up to date. It's kind of the baptism of fire. So uh, it kind of is a replacement for that. Uh, I've substituted that with uh, learning what other people are doing and, you know, and making sense of that and, of course, passing it on to my people as I identify best methods and practices out there. One of the ways I keep myself recharged in the consumer arena is calling on builders. And, again, in that senior salesman role that I talked about when I help out a manager on a recruiting basis, mm-hmm. when I come in and talk about the virtues of the company and wh- where our platform is and what we can do to provide them to you know, help them take their business to the next level. Uh, we do the same, fill that same role on the builder side, and that's primarily the bulk of my business development side, along with, of course, our, our bank franchise, which we're constantly trying to, to go deep versus wide in that and, and, and get some more business out of our bank partners. But on the builder side, you you call on a builder, uh, they're going to get you pretty uh, laser focused on what's working in the marketplace and what your products are and what you, you, what you can do for him because it's a pretty straight business transaction. They're not an emotional uh, resale home seller that's you know, had their house for 30 years. They want to know what can you do for them to help them uh, sell this uh, $2 million inventory homes that they got built. So um, uh, that's where I get my uh, direct infusion of uh, 
you know, kind of training and keeping up to date in the marketplace with what's what's out there and you know being challenged to come up with mm-hmm. new creative ideas. But uh, the but NBA, is a great have- source. NBA is a great source too for ongoing uh, you know information about what's in the marketplace today. They have right. online training and things like that that we utilize quite a bit. Which which you're which you're running the uh, a local uh, YMBA this year, right, for the Washington region? Yes. Uh, which is quite substantial. It's one of the larger ones in the country. And uh, so I, I know you get him very involved in that. Uh, I, I'd like to bounce back a little bit to something that we uh, chatted about just for a minute, but I'd like to get your opinion. And that is, why is there, and, and as proof positive this uh, statement, uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and the NAMB and the NBA, they've all kind of gotten together, which is not easy for them to do, as you know, uh, on uh, this whole issue of licensing. Uh, which leads to a lack of training, which they've articulated very well uh, individually and collectively. Why do you think there's just a, a lack of training out there at all levels in the industry? I'm not alluding to your company. I know your company is actually uh, very progressive in that respect, but you know what's going on out there, and, and it's dismal. You yeah, always room for improvement. Uh, yeah, that's, I, you know, I don't really have a good answer to that question. Uh, I think it really takes an individual company uh, making a commitment that we're going to be a professional uh, practice, if you will, in terms of developing our salespeople into true financial services professionals and, and the, the successful companies, um, you know, whether it be Xerox, IBM, things like that, they've had significant investment and a long-term commitment to training dollars. I think a lot of us do the sunburns, as we call it in the training. You know, they bring the speaker in for the pump up and the motivational talk for the one day, but it's back to that sales management piece. And, and I'll face it, I don't have the solution for it. I'm, I'm uh, struggling with the accountability of it. Is that once you do the initial training, is having you and your managers accountable for follow up and making sure that whatever you've trained mm-hmm. them on, that you believe in, of course, you got to believe in what you've trained them in, that you are accountable for following up and implementing them. And following up, if it be uh, you, you, you bring somebody in a, a training role and uh, train them on uh, needs analysis, interviews with a customer, and they, they give you a list of 20 prospects that they're going to call on, uh, well, over the next 90 days, you got to make sure that they're making those three of those calls a week to get to those uh, you know 20 customers over the next 90 days, and that that takes that takes some discipline and some effort. And uh, like I said, the more you build systems to make it easier for people to implement, you still have a you know group of people that are not going to do it no matter what you do. And the, those people need to you need to move them up or out. They need to do it or. Mm-hmm. They're dragging down the rest of the people. We found out that's probably one of the biggest challenges in a, in a in a management role when you get more than six or eight direct reports. Beyond that, and you've got offices all over the place, uh, you've got to have real good people uh, following up for you from a management standpoint because you uh, tend to have, you know, we've got, I think, 85 some loan officers, and there's probably 25 to maybe even 50 of them in today's market that are not functioning at all eight cylinders, and you've got to find ways to, you know, help coach them, help them get to the next level, provide the tools, but there's a point where if they're not cutting it, you got to, you know, cut your losses and, and move on. And uh, you're doing them a favor and your company a favor at that point because there's a whole bunch of top performers around them that you're not going to be able to attract. First of all, they won't come to your company because you've got underperforming producers there. And then you've got a whole bunch of performers that are looking, why are you tolerating this person? They're taking up space. They're taking up resources. They're just dragging me down in general. You know, that, that positive sales psyche, you've got to put yourself in that positive shell every morning to come in to do business every day. Yeah. Positive attitude. Yeah, right, exactly. So that's a challenge, and I think that's probably a, a critique, uh, biggest defect from my, my area. One is building systems, which is a challenge for me, and then just dealing with the, the, the person who's not a performer that needs to be up there, be, needs to be an A player, and, and uh, they're not going to be an A player and, and moving on. You know, uh, and, and admitting you made a mistake on the hire, whether it be a branch manager particularly, which can set the whole office you know, in a, in a flurry, uh, or individual producers that the manager has, the, you recognize the manager has the same challenges you do, that you need to help them get the motivation to to get that person managed up to the level they need to be or out. And uh, that's probably the biggest challenge we face as producing managers. And I'm not quite in the producing role, but I view that you know, the sales call efforts that I make puts me in that role. At least, like, at least I like to think I'm still doing that job. I'm yeah, and, myself. Well, I, I happen <laughs> to know your personal habits. I knew, I know you. 
uh, travel a lot. And it kind of leads me into my next question. Uh, once again, uh, uh, I'm looking at the other uh, regionals out there and then top executives that are listening to you. And that is uh, because you run 23 offices, and I know how your days are structured because, uh, you know, I get up at 5. I know you get up at 5, and uh, uh, by 6, uh, we're cranking uh, into the night. And uh, how do you manage uh, 23 offices, uh, understanding that you do, there's just physically not enough time to be running around the car and visiting all of them. Although I know you try a lot. Right. I like, know you do. You're on the road an incredible amount of yeah, time. Yeah, unfortunately, all my offices are pretty much within a day's drive of, of where I am, so I'm not getting on an airplane, which is a personal goal for personal balance on the family side. And I, I will say, you know, so it doesn't sound like a, a martyr here. We have uh, three good area managers that work this way, one in particular, Mike on a fry check, who runs our Northern Virginia. Yes, I know. Uh, yeah, he's a, he's a, you know, I view him as a peer and an associate and a partner in our business here. In 29 years in the business, you know, he's had a branch that in 1998, I think, did $360 million a year. Yeah, he's excellent. And he's got 18 officers, and he's got five or six uh, smaller officers reporting into him. So, you know, that really takes care of our Northern Virginia operation, which is, you know, 50% of our business. And, uh, and the rest of the offices, you know, you know, we have two other area managers, one for uh, Delaware, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey is one area manager, and then one also for the suburban Maryland market, if you will. Which works out of your office. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So mm-hmm. he's kind of stuck with me. I kind of like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, guests and fish after three days. Yeah, it's very to, good. Kick them out. You know, try to stay out of their way. Try not to screw up this branch. But uh, Mike has been a good, great business partner. We've, we've, he's been on board for almost 10 years. I've been here 10 years. He's a little over nine, and he'd actually been at the company a couple of years before, and we were able to recruit him back. So he's really helped build the franchise. And uh, you know, like I said, it comes down to it's a people business. Uh, John, there's a, there's a heck of a markup on furniture these days you know, for people selling companies. I don't know. There may not be much demand for selling mortgage banking companies today. Um, Mike is a, a tremendous partner in, in value uh, in an advisory role and talking over a situation where we got an issue facing us in the marketplace, it's nice to have those trusted uh, team players around you that can you know come up with an idea. And he's always got another idea, uh, as Ed does or Rod and everything else. And that's the value. As I said, you just throw them all in a room, and uh, that's invaluable in terms of the training. And we work real hard at kind of our inner sanctum or, or mastermind group within our own you know, managers, and our, to be quite frank, our producers, we actually had a meeting here yesterday for about four hours on our jumbo products, and we literally spent four hours with uh, with lunch included and a working lunch going over uh, some recent product releases we had, and went over some very realistic constructor recommendations uh, corporately of uh, some adjustments to those products that we think will make them more saleable, and more functional, and to be quite frank, more operationally efficient for us because they will eliminate by mainstreaming some of the guidelines will make them more uh, efficient in terms of less exceptions being able to ask for in a, in a, in a volume environment. So mm-hmm. th- that's critical when you get that kind of consensus from, you know, 10 top jumbo originators and you write it out and you take some effort to make a realistic recommendation to the company. The good news is there is our management team and that upside organizational chart does a very good job of listening to those changes. And I think in a big organization, I think uh, one of your other interviewers said, if you can't affect change, it's time to look at another organization, and uh, we certainly feel confident we can affect change here at SunTrust. And yeah, and I think there's some danger uh, in larger organizations like yours, and I'm talking generically, of course, uh, where you can become ossified, uh, where the management layers are too many layers, there's not enough information uh, flowing back and forth, and uh, actually can hinder your performance. And uh, as you say, if you can... Uh, put a good group together. You have good area managers, which happen to know, and uh, certainly you have good branch managers and producers. Uh, but if people at the top uh, won't listen and make those changes, uh, it's all for naught. Absolutely. Let me ask you something about uh, uh, some of the training vehicles. I know you're uh, big on Todd Duncan classes and on some of the other uh, major teachers out there. Uh, I wonder if you talk a, a little bit, uh, not, not so much about Todd, as that, that concept of uh, uh, using trainers and people to help your people. I know you do it personally. Um, I know. I guess I could be described as a training junkie in the, in, mm-hmm. in the business ever since I, I went to a uh, Tom Hopkins seminar in probably, I think, 1975. Yeah, he was great. Year. I saw him back then. Yeah, sure. young rookie realtor. And I think I spent $150 on tapes and came back to the office, and everybody looked at me like, what the heck did you do? You know, and all the uh, the golden neggies, as they called them, you know, telling me, why did you spend that money on those tapes? Those aren't worth the darn thing. And 
Gee, funny, in, in the automobile university, I ended up listening to my cars. I was walking, you know, driving around selling real estate. And, uh, uh, gee, I actually used some of the principles. Uh, I uh, even used some of them to get dates back then in my young single days. You know, the okay. Place, you know, I'm available at seven or eight. Which would you prefer? <laughs> yeah, a, final, a, a final close question. Five days question. in advance. That's called the final close exactly. question. Exactly. Sometimes I had to start on Monday, you know, to, to get that date for Thursday, but uh, it did work out, you know. And uh, uh, there's simple things and words when you're somebody new to the business. Uh, there's no great salespeople are born. I mean, they're trained. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the scripting and the words, and that's true today, uh, uh, skipping ahead a couple of years, uh, we recently used Dennis Black and are utilizing him in our company uh, to do this needs analysis training and also the telephone. More and more of this stuff is happening over the Internet and uh, consumers are talking over the telephone, fax, email. So you're, you're really, it's always been the case, you get the referral from that referral source from your financial planner, your realtor builder, wherever your source is, but then they've given out three names and then you've got to close them on the telephone, at least for the appointment or create a value differentiation is why they should do business with you. And uh, I call it the elevator speech. If you don't have a 30-second elevator speech as to why somebody should do business with you, uh, you're, you're going to lose a lot of times when, you talk, when you're talking to a consumer. And... Uh, Everybody's got to develop that, and that takes time and effort and scripting and thinking about it. And nothing canned, but it's got to be in your own vernacular, in your own comfort zone. Uh, but uh, we're working hard on training. So this box is a perfect example of some reason now to help us do that in the, the uh, telephone skills. Mm -hmm. Do you find your loan officers uh, utilize a lot of training vehicles? Or are, they, or are they encouraged to? Yeah, we encourage them. We'll, we'll even, uh, I'm a big 50-50 fan where, you know, if you're willing to invest in yourself, uh, I'll, I'll go 50-50 with you on it, whether it be a website or a database management program or a voice broadcast system to stay in touch with your customers or a newsletter. Uh, I think that's, i, I got to stop you right there. Uh, every interview I ever do, there's always one great idea that kind of bubbles to the surface, whether uh, people use it but don't articulate it. Uh, that's a fabulous idea uh, where somebody invests half of it themselves. Yeah, and then they, they have ownership on it because that comes back to that. It's, it's, it's called, oh, I call it automatic accountability. If they've got dollars invested in, specifically 50-50 on it, I don't have to worry about following, you know, following up on them to say, hey, did you make those calls on that uh, voice broadcast system? Did you follow up on the calls on the leads that came in? Well, you know, they'd still be happy with their money invested. They don't follow up, but the odds are pretty high that they're either going to follow up on it and get their money's worth or they'll stop investing in themselves. And when they stop investing in themselves, of course, I stop investing too. So my and you also can dollars help. go away at that point. I'm not risking money at that point. All right. But you know how many, from a management standpoint, uh, how many branch and regional managers and uh, uh, national sales directors are, are listing out there that uh, probably don't utilize this? Yeah, you know, also, they're trying to save that uh, 50%. And the other thing I'll do, I'll even go the 100% route on an idea that I think is really good. And I've had plenty uh, of ideas that have failed. I call it the focus group of one, you know, where I just talked to myself and thought it was a great idea and we implemented it. It failed miserably. And, uh, you know, you're quick to, to kill it. I'll invest 100% sometimes where I've got a real good early adapter that probably will do a great job with a new idea but maybe isn't willing to put their own money in on it. I want to try it out, but I want to put it in a good incubator. I'll say, look, I'll pay up. I'll pay 100% of it, you know, for the startup here for the first couple months, and then if it's working, we'll go 50-50 down the road. But I'll, you know, if you, you know, do me a favor and try it, and that's been successful getting people to try it. Um, I also know that when these guys come to me with a good idea, uh, they've they've learned that they're willing to write the check for it. it you know, that's a pretty good sales pitch to me if they're willing to write a check for 100% of it to implement mm -hmm. something, and it works on the other side too. To, they're, they're real smart at presenting it that way to me, and uh, they usually get that 50-50 uh, out of me if it makes sense. Mm. How, how do you uh, how do you manage your day? Because uh, I know that your schedules. I, I happen to know your assistant. Uh, your days are literally booked uh, to the hour. I guess that's the challenge. Our our our, our time management piece is, is an area that I uh, struggle with. You know the. Uh, the interruptions and, and, and you know bo overbooking yourself on appointments and uh, things like that. And also, I, I use the example that uh, with the with the number of people we have, you could literally come in and have your your office empty and your desk cleared and nothing planned and just kind of twiddle your thumbs at eight o'clock in the morning. And you'd have five personnel issues and five things to do. Um, more and more, one of the other challenges, along with the systems 
and you know managing people up or out on a quicker basis. Probably the third biggest challenge on the time management side is is going to time blocking, and I, I struggle with that. I'm, I'm, I'm actually we have a regional team of my support group in the region. Team our ops manager and my assistant are going to again use that outsource training. We the company actually exposed us to this uh, at SunTrust. Uh, Dan and Richmond went to a training class and. Uh, through a, uh, a priority manager uh, company that helps you with time management and task management and delegation management, and we are going to go as a team and do a training class on site in McLean on June 5th uh, to do exactly that. We're going to spend a day and spend some time on our business about how we can be more efficient in managing our time and our tasks, our task management, which is a challenge today. The whole thing of information overload of you know, just managing your schedule and your calendar and utilizing the technology that's out there and how do you manage that and put other people in a position to help you manage your time better, you meaning your assistants and things like that. So uh, we're going to spend a whole day just talking about that and how we can our inter- interdependencies as a regional team um, of the five or six people on my regional team to uh, uh, work better together and manage our time and our interdependencies. So uh, it's a constant challenge. Uh, I try to get the, uh, the uh, tough things done early. That's about best thing I can do is I got five or six things in it. I've been using a day timer system for about 15 years. Uh, I've tried to go to the Palm Pilot but really haven't fully implemented that. Um, but the goal would be to get it more, you know, again, leveraging technology in terms of just managing your tasks and your to-dos and your sales call follow-ups. Uh, but I try to get the tough stuff done first thing in the morning when, uh, to be quite frank, your brain's still clicking and working. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, you know, try to get your sales calls out, you know, late morning where people are still productive you're talking to. Uh, I don't want to be talking to people from 1 to 2.30 during the dead zone in the afternoon if I'm trying to convince them to do business with us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, sometimes uh, from a family balance standpoint, the uh, early evening sometimes or, uh, or Saturday morning are the times when you can get to those top producers uh, on a recruiting opportunity. You know, you want to talk to them about, hey, at least consider us if they're getting, getting ready to make a change in the future. And those guys are t- gals are tough to get to sometimes. you got to find them when they got a kind of an off moment when they're not producing lines. Right. And uh, th- those are challenges. So you end up doing that. And, of course, industry meetings and, and builder meetings and things like that where they have social events and various trade associations that have been involved in uh, create some investment in time. So the biggest challenge I've done with a 17-year-old son who's getting ready to go to college and a 12-year-old son in sixth grade and a uh, uh, 10-year-old daughter and, of course, my wife of... Uh, 20 years coming up in November, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, workaholic piece, uh, you recognize that over time that just doesn't pay for both you personally and your family. So I always struggle to, to uh, create the family balance to be there for the, you know, the dinner time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, my weekends are pretty much uh, with my family. I don't have any, uh, uh, you know, longstanding hobbies that uh, take me away from you know, some tennis and reading mm-hmm. and uh, trying to do a little golf. But, uh, uh, primarily just spending time with my family, a lot on the sidelines, you know, coaching uh, my sixth grader in lacrosse this year and uh, uh, attending all my uh, junior and high school so lacrosse games this spring and things like that. Just time spent with them and the family. We're getting ready to take a trip uh, overseas here coming up in uh, June, too, as I, which you and I talked about. So right. looking forward to spending that time together. As you said, you got to seize the day, if you will. <laughs> well, the, the tangential to this is, is, is the... Uh, is the question of, of how do you manage your stress? Uh, uh, anybody listening to this knows that you're a pretty frenetic guy, and uh, uh, you're you're very intense. And, and uh, for those listeners out there, he's like this all the time. Uh, but it does raise uh, an issue of, of how you do handle stress. I think at your level, and having been a regional manager for two large companies myself, I know that stress is just a it, it's a horrible thing over overhanging yourself if you, if you can't solve it. And I just wonder, uh, you have a couple, a little bit of advice for the people out there. Well, probably not great lately, but uh, you know, and you know, I've talked about is you know, uh, health challenges come up. Uh, uh, you know, your health is everything, and uh, you know, you gotta, you can't let your. Uh, I think there's an, a quote I heard somewhere that most of the people spend the first half of their life gaining wealth, and the second half of it they spend it to regain their health. And uh, you know, you really need to take care of yourself on a you know you know on a physical basis. You know, uh, a sound mind and a sound body, and uh, uh, you know, physically fit. I, I, uh, unfortunately, the last couple of years I haven't done a great job of that. But was in a, yeah, but you were a big jock. You're in good shape. Yeah, in a jock. program in a program with the sergeant's program, which I was in for almost seven years, and uh, worked mm-hmm. out in the mornings three you know, three or four mornings a week you know, from six a.m. to seven a.m. And uh, that actually became a 
a, a, a camaraderie of about 25 guys outside doing uh, military calisthenics, and uh, that became a, almost another, you know, uh, affinity group, if you will. We all count on each other. And that, of course, naturally corrects your diet, John, because you can't eat that, uh, you know, that box of Oreos and a half gallon ice cream the night before and go do 300 push-ups the next morning. It, it tends to naturally. For our audience out there, he's talking to me indirectly here. He knows I went to the buffet the table. And but we come back. the last couple of years, I've had some, some injuries on my knee and stuff like that. Yeah, really, no. That's my excuse, at least, and that's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> you know, I've gotten away from that, and I've noticed that, that that lowers your energy level. So looking to get back to maybe a little lower key situation, whether maybe swimming or mm-hmm. you know, something to just keep the keep the physical uh, energy level up. And of course, you know, diet. We're all challenged with the temptations of you know what you eat. And, uh, what that does for you, but, but you also I, mean, I don't think I'm giving anybody new information mm-hmm. on that one. Yeah, uh, but there is something I think that uh, uh, you did mention there that I want to follow up, and maybe this will be the final point we talk about, and that is you seem to set aside uh, as much as you can uh, family time. Uh, you said that you try not to work uh, weekends if you don't have to, unless it's a special appointment. Um, and with, make it early as possible today, so it's not interfering with anybody else's, uh, you know other things they want to do yeah i, I think it's i think at your level uh people can uh, literally kill themselves on the job i mean you can go 24 hours a day if you want absolutely and I'm, I'm probably accused of that corporately uh because of uh you know people look at you with your you know portable phone and your pager and your own you know voicemail constantly and things like that but uh you know i view those as uh uh, tools that help you manage your time. You know, I, I can respond pretty quickly to stuff. Thank God for technology today. And, uh, of course, virtual adjacency, you know, you can work out of the home office, uh, you know, and get a lot accomplished. If you've got a, you know, laptop and a fax machine and, uh, you know, portable phone, you can do a heck of a lot from a lot of places. So uh, uh, you're able to balance that time, uh, you know, these days, particularly if you're, you know, going to another office or something like that, you don't need to always check into the main portal, if you will, to, to get something accomplished, which is, uh, and you have good people, too, that know what to do, and that comes mm-hmm. investing some time in training them. So, uh, you know, the, I do do, do do that family time, do value it. Unfortunately, the last couple of years, I've valued it pretty hard, and uh, that's that's paying off in those relationships with my family. And uh, they may it'd be interesting if you did interviews of each of them, they'd probably say, oh, he's just, he's just telling you that, you know, you know that's, you're just kidding on that one. But, uh, you know, I do make it a point of not doing business in front of them, and that's as simple as not listening to voicemail mess when you get your kid riding in the car with you. You, know, you just do that. And maybe I'm doing it at 10 o'clock sitting in the driveway, but I'm not going to let them see me. Kind of like don't let them see you sweat. Don't let them see you work if you are doing mm-hmm. it. Um, and that that's, I think, a very effective uh, way to uh, at least uh, show them that you're, when you're home, you're home. Right. And I, I think this is a good point to end it on a family note and uh, on a quality note, too. And uh, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to talk to the other regionals and executives and uh, branch managers out there that are listening to you. Uh, I know you had a lot of salient points today, uh, having to know, you know, the, the success that you've enjoyed. And uh, you're well-respected. Uh, no one becomes head of the MBA in that area without being well-respected. And I uh, just wanted to thank you for taking your time. John, enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully uh, some of the uh, personal stuff at the end was uh, of value and uh, enjoyed it. Again, I'd I, uh, be interested in anybody that's uh, you know, interested in calling me or information or trading ideas, other regionals. Uh, should I give them my contact points? Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Well, uh, we're, 